Uh, good evening and welcome to the Lensic. Uh, I'm Chris Kempis. I'm a professor at the Santa Fe Institute where I research general laws in biology with the hope of being able to predict things like evolutionary history um, and astrobiology. The Santa Fe Institute has been hosting these community lectures since 1986. Um, and this series has produced lively and diverse talks on a variety of cutting edge research topics for 33 years now. In addition to being very interesting, the series serves as a reflection of the diverse set of research activities ongoing at the Institute. Activities that span the sciences and find commonality between diverse ideas. Over the years, SFI has brought thought leaders at the forefront of science to the Santa Fe Institute and to Santa Fe for these lectures. And past lecturers have included Francis Quick, Kenneth Arrow, and Leonard Susskin, amongst many, many others. The Santa Fe Institute has been able to produce these high quality lectures thanks to partnerships with our community-minded local organizations. And with that, I'd like to give a special thank you to Thornburg Investment Management, who has generously underwritten this lecture series for the last five years. Without their support, we would not be able to host these lectures at all, let alone continue to offer them to Santa Fe at no cost. So let's thank Thornburg Investment Management. We'd also like to thank the Lensic Performing Arts Center for their additional support of this series. And lastly, we'd like to extend our thanks to a new supporter, the Santa Fe Reporter. For tonight, we are lucky enough to have Danielle Bassett giving our lecture. Uh, Danielle is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania where she works on an enormous range of topics. Danny's work spans condensed matter physics to neuroscience to social systems. And in each of these areas, she brings new theoretical and mathematical tools to bear on important pure and applied problems. The questions that she is interested in are some of the most interesting in modern science. What are, human what are the human algorithms for learning? How can interventions be taken on the dynamics of a brain? How do we encode curiosity? Danny will talk much more about these topics tonight. Um, and I just want to mention that she has a very long list of accolades, which I couldn't possibly list here tonight. So if I, it's suffice to say that she, these include winning a MacArthur Fellowship, an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, and the Erdős Rennie Prize in Network Science. I'm very much looking forward to her talk. And with that, please help me in welcoming Danielle Bassett. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight. Thank you for the organizers and to the donors who made this possible. It's a really wonderful um, set of events, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, and most of all, um, I'm very excited to meet all of you. I think this is probably the first time we've met, at least for most of us. Um, I often get a little bit nervous the first time I meet someone. So I read somewhere in a book um, that one, a really great thing to do if you're nervous meeting someone for the first time is to tell them a little bit about yourself. So um, I've decided to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so I um, was homeschooled from kindergarten through 12th grade, so all the way through until I went to college. And my parents had this really wonderful uh, home library that was, uh, had at least 1,000 books the last time we counted. Um, and so I, I grew up really loving reading and loving all kinds of um, areas of science, of humanities, of philosophy. And in fact, when I became uh, around high school age, I really thought that I was going to be a philosopher. Um, so there's that. And then um, another interesting tidbit about myself is that my dad is an orthopedic surgeon. And when I was young, even sort of seven years old, he would come back with videos of new surgeries that he had to learn. And he would play them on the local video, you know, our videotape. Just, I forget what they used to call them. But anyway, um, uh, and I would, I would sit there next to him and watch these videos of these new uh, different kinds of uh, surgeries that he had to do. So I became really fascinated by the human body and by the, the beautiful mechanics of the human body and the idea that a physician can intervene um, so carefully and so precisely to make someone uh, better. So I became very interested in biology at that point as well. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, it, towards the later years of, of high school, well, homeschooled high school, I uh, became very interested in mathematics and in physics, and I just thought it was so amazing that we could take these very simple formalisms and formulations and use them to understand the world around us. I was just blown away by the fact that we can use these, these simple mathematical constructs to explain really complicated things from the universe uh, to the human mind. So one thing I think that was a common theme across all of these different interests was the mind. So whether it was philosophy of the mind, biology of the mind, or mathematics of the mind. Um, and ever since then, I've been really fascinated with the mind itself and trying to tackle it from all of these different perspectives. Um, so when I think about the mind today, is a little bit different than how I thought about it as a seven-year-old. When I think about the mind today, um, I often actually think about Leonardo da Vinci, and the reason that I think about him is that he made some of the most beautiful artistic representations of the organ of the mind, which is the human brain. And when I think about Leonardo da Vinci, I often think about his book called Thoughts on um, Art and Life. And the reason that I think about that book is that it, it provides a really beautiful context for why the mind does what it does. Often it's to create or to engage in relationships with um, other individuals. And that brings me to thinking about love and friendship, which motivates many of the things that we do in our lives, whether it's science or art. And when I begin to think about love and friendship, I think about Facebook and Twitter and <laughs> Snapchat. And obviously, Leonardo da Vinci is probably rolling over in his grave that I put these two on the same slide. Um, so I apologize. Um, but I do want to ask the question, is this more than just free association? What do these two things have in common, if anything? Um, so on the left-hand side, we have social engineering systems like Facebook. I actually didn't even know the, the little icon for Snapchat. I had to put that in because somebody told me I should really you know, get with the program here. Um, all right, so what is, the, what is the similarity between a social engineering program and uh, the uh, human brain? On the surface of it, these two things are, could not be more different. Um, however, if you think about them in terms of their underlying mathematical structure, they have some really beautiful similarities that we can actually use to try to understand the human brain better. And that underlying mathematical similarity is that they both turn out to be networks. So what is a network? A network is um, an object like this, which is composed of units, which we often call nodes, and then relationship between units, which we often call edges. Now, the first very simple question is, how is Facebook or other social engineering systems a network? And that's pretty straightforward, right? So a node in the network is a person, and a edge between two people is a friendship. Uh, and of course, we can put terms on here, like uh, the geeks and the jocks and the emo and the goth, which were very relevant when I was younger. Um, I've been told by uh, undergraduates who, who uh, engage in research in my laboratory that these terms are very outdated. So you can uh, put whichever uh, term you prefer from your uh, experience, high school experience probably, um, on those uh, little groupings. Okay, so the mapping of friendships uh, to uh, networks is very straightforward, but what about the brain? How is the brain a network? On the surface of it, this is a wet, gooey organ that sits inside of your skull, and there's nothing about it that is really um, particulate in that way that a social network is. So what I'd like to do is to suggest that we look inside and see whether we can understand mathematically why the network structure is relevant for understanding the mind. The first question we have to ask is, what are the nodes in this network? What are the pieces, what are the units of the human mind. And that's obviously a question that's been asked not just today, but in historical times as well, and <clears throat> was answered in, a, um, in the pseudoscience of phrenology. So at that point, the idea was that there are specific portions of the brain um, that code for specific functions, or even specific uh, morphologies of the skull that code for specific functions as well. And so in the age of phrenology, we would have regions that are important for ideality, for veneration, for firmness, for benevolence, and for human nature itself. So very, very abstract concepts. Now, the actual terms that are located here and associated to specific regions of the brain are not the way that we think about it as neuroscientists today. However, the idea that a region can code for a single function is something that we do hold as neuroscientists. And why do we hold that? What experimental evidence has been brought to bear to um, suggest that? We often use what's called a magnetic resonance imaging machine. And these are commonly found in hospitals, and research-grade ones are often found um, either at research hospitals or at universities. And what these uh, um, 
machines do is that they allow us to map out the regions that become active in the brain when we perform a particular task. So if you read the New York Times or Scientific American or Discover Magazine, you probably often see pictures like what you see on the bottom right, which is a, a brain with some color on it, usually yellows and reds, that indicate that's the region that becomes active when you do X. In this case, it's playing the piano. Your uh, motor cortex becomes active. Now, what's nice about this is that we can go through and have human uh, volunteers perform many different tasks inside of the scanner, and then we can identify, oh, that's the region that becomes active when you speak. That's the region that becomes active when you do this. That's the region that becomes active when you do that. And that helps us to map out what these nodes are, what these regions are that code for specific functions. But that's not the end of the story. Where um, are the edges inside of this system? Um, now, understanding the edges or the relationships or connections between different parts of the brain is an endeavor that has also been important over several decades. And uh, probably the most canonical circuit that we know of is the circuit involved in language processing. And so when you think about language, you have to realize that there's actually no single piece of your brain that becomes active in language processing or in language production. It's actually a whole set of regions. So information comes in through your visual cortex if you're reading or through your auditory cortex if you're listening as you are doing right now. And then it gets propagated through the rest of the brain to Broca's area and Wernicke's area and then eventually out into motor cortex which allows you to speak back to me or to raise your hand um, or to do the other uh, motoric um, movements that you, that you do in response to speech. So in other words, there's a whole constellation of regions and their relationships, the passage of information between them that allows you to perform language. Now, that's really nice if we're talking about language. However, there are many functions of a human brain that we do not understand at that level. We don't understand what the circuits actually are. And so often we're faced with the question of how could we perhaps find all circuits that are available uh, to the brain to use? And answering that question has actually only become possible in the last roughly 10 years. And that is through this specific type of imaging, which is called diffusion imaging. This is again done on a magnetic resonance imaging machine, but it maps out the diffusion of water molecules inside of your brain. Now water molecules, if you didn't know, are constantly bouncing around in your brain by Brownian motion. Um, but they are actually constrained along these big bundles of neuronal axons. So for anybody who um, for, sort of forgets or has not learned what a neuronal axon is, neurons are cell bodies in the brain. And the neuron cell body looks a little bit like a hand, has a, a center, and then it has dendrites coming out of it, and then it has a long tail. That long tail is called an axon, and that allows that cell to communicate to the other cell that's way down here. So what you have in your brain is huge bundles of these axons that allow for information to be passed from, from one piece of the brain to another. And that's those streamlines or those threads that you see in the brain right there. Now what's fascinating about this sort of picture is that it can be acquired non-invasively in any human. So meaning um, it doesn't hurt you, there's no uh, side effects, it's just an image um, like an x-ray for example. And what's also fascinating about this is that these patterns, this, the connections inside of your brain, are different for every single person. And what scientists are finding over the last couple of years is that that pattern is almost like a fingerprint. And it relates to many of the things or helps us uh, understand many of the things that you find easy to do in your daily life and also many of the things that you find more difficult. And we'll get to that in a second. All right, so those are the edges inside of the network. So here is the network now, right? So there are nodes, which are regions of the brain that code for a specific function, and then there, then there are these wires that connect up different parts of the brain. All right, so now we have a network. Now we understand why it's like Facebook, right? But now the question is, how do we study it, and how do we use that information to try to understand how the brain truly works? What we often use are many tools that have de been developed in the field of network science, which is a very interdisciplinary and rather emerging area of science that allows us to think about complex systems by distilling them down into their units and a pattern of relationships between their units. The field pulls on many other um, traditionally distinct disciplines like computer science, mathematics, physics, engineering, statistics, and even visualization, actually. So what we do is that we use these kind of tools to understand what the architecture of a network is. Now, if I show you these two networks, let's say one of them is my brain and one of them is my friend's brain, 
And I asked you, are, are these two networks the same or different? Actually, I could ask my preschooler that. And he would say, of course, they're different. Um, but then if I ask, well, how are they different? Can you tell me how they're different? That becomes a lot harder. This is a, they're both pretty complicated patterns. So what network science does is that it allows us to use mathematics to explicitly quantify what's different about the pattern on the left from the pattern on the right. And why that becomes important is that then we can compare um, a healthy brain with one that has uh, a, a disease, or we can compare an eight-year-old brain with a 22-year-old brain. Um, and these comparisons become important for us to understand cognitive function. All right, so in truth, network science is basically a bunch of math that allows us to characterize the architecture of these systems. Now, I want you to give you an intuition for why this matters and how it works to understand the brain. Okay, so here is the most fantastic information processing system you can imagine. Not actually. It's a very simple toy graph, but what I want you to imagine is that we want to use this to transfer information. Now, if I wanted to start and have information on this left side over here, and I wanted to send information all the way over to the other side, I have a couple options with how I would want to do that. Perhaps, and the smartest way to do it, would be to follow these red lines. So I would take one hop, two hops, three hops, right? So I can get information from one side of the network to the other side in three hops. Or I could take a more circuitous route. So for, perhaps I could go down around here, and then around here, and then around here a couple times maybe, you know? And then eventually over here. That's what your, your mind feels like on a red eye, you know? It's like, ooh, <laughs> taking a few extra turns around the corner there. All right, so um, what we can do is that we can actually quantify that idea by calculating what's called the shortest path from one piece in the network to another. So the shortest path here is through one, two, three hops, and obviously there are many longer paths, but we care about the shorter paths. And the question is, how would you construct a, a brain network, if you had the option of constructing one, so that it had relatively short paths to get from any piece of the brain to any other piece of the brain? Your brain is an amazing information processing machine that has to be able to transmit information very freely across, across wide ranges of space. All right, so we could build a network like this which is where we have a lot of local connectivity. Um, however, this is not particularly good for information transmission, right? Because if I had to send information from the left side to the right side, I'd have to go across half of the circle, okay? Not so efficient. On the right-hand side, this is a relatively efficient information uh, transmission system because it can send information from one side to the other very quickly. However, it loses the capacity to have local information processing. So there's no um, help by neighboring regions to process information. This middle piece right here has a, the best of both worlds, which is that you have local processing here, as well as these, these long-distance connections that allow you to transmit information to the other side very, very quickly. So when we look at humans, we actually find um, that, many, that all of us have this sort of architecture. And in fact, it's not just humans. We also see that across many different uh, species. So we've studied humans, we've studied macaque monkeys, we've studied mice, uh, Drosophila, which is a fly, and C. elegans, which is a nematode or a worm. And what we found is that very, very consistently, there tend to be uh, mostly local paths, but then these short, uh, these long distance connections which allow shortcuts of information transmission across the entire brain. And that's very consistent across all the species. But then, if we just, or that we've studied, the species that we've studied, I should say. But then if we just look inside of the human and we look at the variation in this feature across humans, we can actually see that that variation is related to the way the brain works. So this is a really beautiful study, not from my lab, um, but from another lab that shows that this prevalence of short paths in the network is actually positively related to full-scale uh, IQ. So uh, individuals who have higher IQ tend to have relatively short paths through their brain networks, um, and individuals with lower IQ tend to have longer paths uh, within their brain networks. And that's really interesting because it suggests that this network uh, representation of a human brain is not only an interesting correspondence to social networks, but it's relevant for understanding how the system works as an information processing system, okay? Now, why do you think short paths would make for better brains? This, so this is a simulation where we're just trying to illustrate the fact that if you want to transmit information across this entire system, you have to have, on average, relatively short paths um, throughout the entire thing. But I also hope that this movie makes you start thinking about not just where 
the paths are, but how information gets transmitted. And so I wanna make, a, I wanna make an analogy to um, traffic and to roadway systems, because I think it's helpful to help us understand how the brain works. So on the left-hand side, these structural wires that I told you about earlier, I think of them as sort of the highways of the brain. Um, but knowing where the highways are is not as important, at least to me, living around Philadelphia, as knowing what the traffic is like on each of the highways, right? I really wanna know what the traffic is so that I can choose the correct path for myself to get to Penn in time for my class. All right, so we want to make the, the, the we want to distinguish between the structural highways and the traffic that exists on top of them. Now, what I would really love to do and say to you tonight is that we have a perfect measurement of traffic on human brains that's non-invasive. Um, the answer is we actually don't have that. However, what we can do is make an indirect inference of where the traffic is in a human brain, and the way that we do that is that we say, well, let's measure the activity of every single brain region in this second, and let's measure it again at this second, and let's measure it again at this second, and every second we'll take a picture of the pattern of activity across the entire brain. And then what we'll do is that we'll say, if two regions of the brain are changing in activity with one another, then they're possibly sharing information with each other. So in other words, if two regions are increasing in activity together, and then decreasing in activity together, and then increasing again together, and decreasing again together, so they're following each other in their activity, we say that those two regions are functionally con connected. They're probably responding to the same stimulus or possibly sharing information among them. So that's our measurement of traffic uh, for a human brain, and it's a non-invasive measurement. Um, so then, once we do that, we can construct a second type of network for the human, which is the traffic network. We call it a functional network. And an interesting question is, how should I study that network to better understand how cognitive processes function in a healthy human or in a non-healthy human? Um, and I actually want to go back to the illustration from social networks because I think it actually helps us very much to understand what to do here. So here's an example of a social network that I want to um, draw on. So this is a, a, a picture of Caltech Facebook friends. And so each dot here is a different student at Caltech. The color of the dot indicates the house that the student lived in. And so what you can generally see is a strong clustered structure, or we often call it community structure or modular structure. Uh, and you often find that uh, so over here, most of the people who live in the yellow house tend to be friends with other people in the yellow house. That makes sense. People in the purple house here tend to also be friends with other people in the purple house. There are these really interesting um, people in the center that don't tend to be friends with their own house, but tend to be friends with at least one other person in almost every house. So those are really fascinating because they can be important brokers of information between the different houses. And that actually becomes very important when we think about the brain as well because there are these areas in the brain as well that sit between different clusters. The other important um, feature I wanted to point out over here is that there's a little red guy right inside of the purple house. So he's not friends with anyone in the red house, but he's friends with everyone in the purple house, and we're pretty sure he should move. So here is the picture of what that sort of structure looks like in a human brain. So here, each of the, uh, the circles is a region of the brain, and the color code from the left-hand side is the same as the color code on the right, so you can map across. So for example, these regions over here are very strongly connected with one another. They're all located in the back of your brain, which is uh, the occipital cortex that helps you with visual processing or processing information that comes in through your eyes. Um, there are also regions of the brain uh, over here in purple that are important for um, audition, so listening, and also for language. And there are regions of the brain that are important for many other functions as well. What we basically find is that there are these separate groups that seem to performing, perform specific kinds of functions, and that's shown by their pattern of activity, their dynamic pattern of activity. And I like to liken this to an orchestra, um, where we have many different kinds of functions in an orchestra, right? We have the brass, we have the strings, we have the woodwinds, we have the percussion, um, and they tend frequently to be communicating with one another in the sense that they're um, playing similar um, uh, melodies, specifically the strings, but that's also true for some of the other um, systems as well. So we have that separation, and yet together it creates this resonant, beautiful architecture, which is what we see in the human mind as well. 
Okay, so this observation that there are really beautiful clustered structure inside of the brain and that those clusters seem to code for specific kinds of functions is something that's uh, motivated many new questions across a wide variety of areas. So I wanted to specifically highlight these because it helps to um, showcase the interdisciplinary nature of the investigations that are going on motivated by this work. So number one in psychology, we ask how do these network modules change in different brain states? Number two, in neuroscience, what roles do neurophysiological processes play in, the, um, in these modules? Number three, in medicine, how are networks altered in psychiatric disease or in neurological disorders? In mathematics, we try to understand what uh, graph models are most like the brain and why. In statistics, we're trying to understand how we can infer um, true uh, signal from noise in the data. In physics, we're trying to understand what role that network structure plays in material properties. That's actually extremely important for traumatic brain injury. So if you have this um, structural wiring in your brain, right, uh, that's, that's very heterogeneous, that actually is a conduit for force um, from a traumatic brain injury in a way uh, that differs across, depending on where the individual was hit. And so that's, this work is playing a very important role in understanding the effect of traumatic brain injury on cognition. Um, and then in art, what role does the network structure play in the creative process and why? So I think that all of these uh, questions are very exciting and I could certainly finish off the talk with these questions, but I actually want to um, place the statement out there that there's one big elephant in the room uh, from all of this work, and that is that if I really want to understand human cognition, there is no single picture I sh could show you that would explain human cognition. And that's because a picture ignores the dimension of time. Human cognition is dynamic, it's changing constantly, right? So if we want to understand how the human mind works, we have to have an approach that's dynamic in nature. How are these networks changing as you think about um, going home tonight or as you go to work tomorrow? Um, how do they change over development? How do they change with age? Uh, how do they change when you're anxious versus less anxious? So this is really where the work needs to go. So how can we do that? Well, one way is that we can take those same um, images of the brain and those same patterns of activity that we acquire from magnetic resonance imaging, and we can say, well, let's extract the functional network, so that traffic network, just from the first two minutes of data, okay? And then let's look at the next two minutes of data and construct a network of what paths were used there. And then the next two minutes of data, and the next two minutes of data. That allows us to actually create a, a movie of the network reconfiguring over time, showing different paths of information processing and communication as a function of time. So where have we been using that? We've been using that technique to understand long-term reconfigurations in human learning. And we've been focusing initially on motor skill learning, and so that's relevant for a child learning to ride a tricycle. It's relevant for anyone who plays a musical, musical instrument. That's motor learning. It's also relevant for anyone who plays a sport. That's also motor learning. So how does this happen? How does motor learning happen in the brain? And can we watch it happen in real time and see how these networks are changing? Um, the way that we did that initially in the lab is through a very highly stylized experiment, um, which I've been told is very similar to Guitar Hero, for anybody who has played Guitar Hero before. Um, so the idea is basically that uh, human participants, volunteers, go into the scanner and they see this pseudo-musical staff here. Um, you can see there's no clef, therefore it's pseudo-musical. And you, they also are holding a response button box in their hand that has four buttons. So this says, um, press the purple button, then the blue one, then the green one, then the red one, then the blue one, then the purple one, et cetera, okay? And then they practice these passages over and over and over and over again over the course of three days. And to ensure that they're learning, we uh, calculate the movement time, which is the time from the first button press to the last button press, and we see how that changes as a function of time. What you can see is that over the three days of practice, there's a significant decrease in the time it takes them to play one of these little passages. And that's similar to what any of you would um, attest to if you uh, play a musical instrument or if you play a, um, a sport or if you learned to ride a tricycle when you were a child. 
Okay, so what we did in this experiment was to ask, what is happening in the brain as people are learning? So here we know that behavior is changing, we know the output is changing, so that what is happening inside that allows for that to change? So what we did is exactly what I described before, which is that we took a two minute window and extracted that pattern of um, functional relationships between brain regions, and then we did it again the next two minutes and again and again. We had 75 networks in a row for each person that mapped out that reconfiguration of the brain over time. And what we found is this beautiful um, architecture, which is that those strong modules that I showed you before are still present, but they tend to reconfigure at their boundaries. So while the, the modules themselves are relatively strong, what happens at their intersection changes a lot. So you'll have regions of the brain that initially are communicating with one module and then it change over time. So look at this peach one is becoming more and more strongly connected to the yellow module. So it's switching over to its, its communication pattern to the yellow one. I like to think a little bit about dance partners and swapping dance partners in this um, part of the talk because that's, that's really what these regions are doing is that initially they're partnering with one um, other region or set of regions, and then at some point in the dance they switch over and they partner with a different set. And that allows for a change in the pattern of communication that is then supportive of learning um, new information. So what we found over the last couple years is that brains that are very flexible like this, that's, that change these dance partners frequently throughout time, are um, correlated with individual differences in, in how well that individual learns. So the more flexible the brain, uh, the better visual motor learning is, the more cognitively flexible that person is, the higher working memory performance the person has, um, and better statistics in planning and reasoning. So um, I think it's also, you know, we can, we can think a little bit about the orchestral example here too, because every now and then you have the flute uh, not playing with other woodwinds, but playing with the strings instead, right? Or every now and then you have the trumpets um, playing with uh, the bass or the harp. Uh, and that, that change in communication can really change the, the timbre of the music in the same way that, um, or in an analogous way to the way the brain is changing its pattern of communication. All right, so that motivated me to ask the question, well, if flexibility is related to these wonderful things like um, working memory and learning and cognitive flexibility, is there a way for us to change maybe our lifestyle or um, something else to enable better, more flexible brains? And so what we did is that we studied this uh, wonderful data set that was actually acquired by a fantastic professor at Stanford University. His name is Russell Poldrack. And what he did is that he actually scanned himself twice a week for an entire year. On Tuesdays he was fasting, I think, and on Thursdays he had eaten breakfast. And then he also did an entire cognitive battery, which is a set of tests that test his cognitive function that day, and uh, uh, filled out a bunch of questionnaires. So not only did he give us up a year of his life doing this, but then he deposited all of that data online for any scientist anywhere in the world to freely use and study. So big kudos to Russ Poldrack. I think that's really an amazing thing for a scientist to do. And what we found studying his data is that on the days when he was rested and fed, um, he tended to have a more positive attitude, was also much more attentive and scored more highly on the attention tests, and he also had higher brain flexibility on those days. So that this is a correlative finding, but it suggests a causal hypothesis we could test, which is that if we alter um, the amount of rest, or um, food that someone has in the morning that would change their attitude and that would also change their brain flexibility. Now, if I tell this uh, story of this, this study to a elementary school teacher, they say, oh, well, of course. <laughs> I know that when my kids are not uh, rested and fed, they don't do very well. Um, but it's really nice to see some empirical backing from neuroscience uh, to support that. Now, I also want to suggest that there are some individuals um, who do not have the capacity to change their lifestyle in this particular way. And so we still want to know whether there's an intervention that we could come up with that would be able to enhance flexibility for them. And so what we've done over the last couple of years is collaborate with Andreas Meyer-Lindenberg at the Central Institute of Mental Health in Mannheim, Germany. 
And he has this wonderful data set where, where healthy individuals um, were either taking placebo or were taking dextromethorphan, which is a drug. It is an NMDA receptor antagonist. And we find that there's actually significantly greater flexibility when the individuals are on DXM. So that suggests that there is a pharmacological intervention that we could offer to enhance flexibility. And I'm really interested in asking whether we could use that um, prior to rehabilitation, uh, particularly after stroke, and see if we can increase our speed recovery, particularly of uh, motor skills, after stroke. So that's the direction of that work at the moment. Um, OK. Now, I think all of that is amazing and exciting, and I love this area of science. But I wanted to step back and ask some really big questions here um, in the last couple minutes, and that is, what is learning? And to what degree do our laboratory experiments help us to understand the type of learning that occurs, for example, in a classroom? Or maybe every day at work for you? So this type of experiment that I talked to you about is very relevant for understanding motor skill learning specifically. Um, but is it relevant for understanding learning broadly and the kind of learning that each of you are engaging with by coming to a community lecture on science, right? Um, all right, well, to understand what is learning, I'm going to ask the, ask the broader question, which is what is knowledge? What we're seeking when we are trying to learn. So we're seeking knowledge. So what is knowledge? And if we better understand what knowledge is, perhaps we can change the kind of experiments that we do to tackle that question more precisely. Right? So I wanted to um, quote John Dewey here in his 1916 Democracy and Education, where he says, knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. Thus, we get at a new event indirectly instead of immediately by invention, ingenuity, and resourcefulness. And ideally, perfect knowledge would represent such a network of interconnections that any past experience would offer a point of advantage from which to get at the problem in a new experience. All right, beautiful, right? So knowledge is a network. It's a network of interconnections between concepts, between ideas, between problems. Now, if that's the case, then how do we gain this knowledge network? If we're interested in learning, how do we, how do we grab that? Um, I think we do it in two ways. One is by curiosity. So again, from Dewey, curiosity is not an accidental, isolated possession. It's a necessary consequence of the fact that an experience is a moving, changing thing involving all kinds of connections with other things. Curiosity is but the tendency to make those conditions perceptible. So certainly, curiosity drives us to understand the connections. Why? Why is this related to this? Or what is related to this over here? How can I, how can I build, how can I grow what it is that I know? But we also learn knowledge networks by example. And that's particularly important for classroom situations. So to give you an illustration of how we learn knowledge networks by example, I wanted to tell you a little story, which is um, recounted in Robert McFarland's book called Landmarks, which is a really wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Um, it's a story about Roger Deakin, who was an English writer and documentary uh, maker on UK waterways, specifically. So, uh, the story is about a mentee who invites Roger, who was his mentor, to Cambridge University, where the mentee is currently studying. And the mentee's idea is, well, if I invite my very famous mentor to come and give a talk at Cambridge, everyone else at Cambridge will think more highly of me because my mentor gave a really great talk. Okay? So that was his goal. And now here is his memoir of that now infamous day. He says, I stared dedicatedly at my shoes. Embarrassed that my friend was failing to perform in front of my academic peers, it was only later that I realized it wasn't a failure to perform, but a failure to conform. Cambridge seminars expect rigor and logic in their presentations, um, braced subtlety of exposition and explanation, tested proofs of cause and consequence. But, Roger, or, but water doesn't do rigor in that sense. And neither did Roger, though his writing was often magnificently precise in its poetry. For Roger, water flowed fast and wildly through culture. It was protean, it was slipshape, and so that was how he followed it. Slipshod and shipshape at once, moving from a word here to an idea there, too fast for his notes or his audience to keep up with, joining his watery subjects by means of an invisible network of tunnels and drains. 
I feel really bad for the mentee, right? Um, on the other hand, I'm fascinated by Roger. So there's this person who's just an, an amazing, um, uh, well, he's an amazing scholar, and he gives lectures in this architecture that's very similar to his subject. So he gives watery lectures, lectures that sort of meander around, sometimes slow too fast, sometimes too slow. You know, it's fascinating. Okay, so that makes me wonder, um, are lectures in general, perhaps, are they, could they be thought of as walks through networks? And maybe it's not just lectures, maybe it's books. The book that you're currently reading, is that a walk through a network of ideas, of concepts? So perhaps you're reading a linear algebra textbook. <laughs> um, and the architecture of that linear algebra textbook is highly structured, right? And so that walk through those ideas is very highly structured. I say that because we're currently studying linear algebra textbooks to understand their network architecture. So there's a backstory to that. Um, or perhaps you're reading a book on UK waterways and you may see more of this tortuous uh, information transmission. Or perhaps you're reading a history book. Now in history, um, there's often more of this tendril-like nature, right? Because you're following a story through time and it's relatively linear often, or at least that's how we can often understand why things happened in history the way that they happened. Um, all right, so that makes me ask the question of, is there perhaps an optimal way of walking through a network in lectures or in books or in papers? So let's suppose that you are currently reading a book um, and the, or a book chapter specifically, and the author has these 15 ideas that they hope to present to you. If it's a, um, if it's a fictional book, you know, perhaps this is all information about the protagonist, this is information about a counterplot, this is information about the history of the protagonist in their uh, prior life. Um, and the, the author has to go through all of these pieces of information, but they have to walk through it in some sort of way that makes you, on the other side, understand what that broader architecture was. And what makes this really difficult is that language is formally linear. You only read one word before you read the next word, right? And they can only write one word before they write the next word. So everything that you take in from a lecture or from a book um, or from a paper is a linear transmission of information, but it's a transmission of what's probably a much higher dimensional, much more complicated object. So this is the picture of what's happening and what I'm really fascinated by. This, I think, is what learning really is. So here's the brain of the speaker or a writer. It has this um, beautiful network structure of ideas, concepts, problems, and how they relate to one another. The brain of the speaker or writer maps that into the one dimension of time, either in writing or in audio, so that the brain of the listener or reader on the other side can optimally reconstruct what that beautiful higher dimensional object was. Now, how do we do that? We do that regularly. We all write, we all communicate with one another, we all speak to each other, we all take very complicated ideas and map them into 1D. How do we do it? It's amazing. And also, how does this person on the other side reconstruct this complicated object from a linear stream of information? This actually is a beautiful um, function of the human mind that's important for many, many um, behaviors beyond listening to a lecture or reading a book. So in fact, the problem of inferring patterns of pairwise dependencies like this between, uh, from incoming streams of data allows us to learn language to begin with. This is how it's thought that infants actually learn language. Helps us to segment visual images, to parse tonal groupings in music, to parse spatial scenes, to infer social networks around us, and to perceive distinct concepts. So it's pervasive in all of our lives. Now what we've been doing over the last couple um, years is trying to understand, is there a particular kind of network architecture that's easy to map into one dimension and that's also easy for the other person to reconstruct? So is it perhaps this um, circular one? Is it best if I were to give a lecture that's circular? <laughs> that means to different things to different people. Um, is it best if I give a lecture that has um, more of a torus shape? 
or that's very densely filled in, or that has mostly triangles, so I close every gap in knowledge I form, I close immediately, I relate every concept to every other concept as much as possible. What is the optimal way of presenting information and sharing that architecture with one another? What we found over the last couple of years is that in fact this architecture, this very highly modular one that I showed you earlier, tends to be very easily learned by many different people across many different ages. Um, and so we actually think that there might be something, we haven't, uh, I should say, we haven't comprehensively evaluated every network architecture that's out there in the world, but our initial evidence suggests that this modular architecture is very, very easy for humans to learn. And perhaps that would help us to present information in classrooms, to write books, to write papers, and to communicate with one another better. But I think probably one of the most interesting um, features or corollaries of this observation is that what I told you earlier is that the human mind, the human brain looks very modular itself. So it is composed of these dense clusters of connectivity between brain regions. And then what we're finding is that actually the network architectures that we, are very, that we find very easy to learn have this modular structure as well. And that reminds me of this beautiful um, passage from Aristotle's Metaphysics where he said, mind thinks itself because it shares the nature of the object of thought, for it becomes an object of thought in coming into contact with and thinking about its objects, so that mind and object of thought are the same. That raises all sorts of interesting questions. Is the architecture of an optimally learnable network over here a topological reflection of the optimally developed neural network over here? Or is this correspondence in structure simply just happenstance? I think it's probably not happenstance. I think it's probably more than that. Perhaps it tells us something important about the nature of modeling in the human brain. Now that's a rather large question, and I'm actually gonna leave it there. Um, I would like to um, acknowledge the people who are very important in this work, um, particularly these individuals here who performed a lot of the experiments for the data that I showed you today. Um, the team itself is quite large. We have, um, I'm very grateful for funding from many different organizations that have supported the work over the last few years. I want to thank you for listening. Um, again, it was very nice to meet you. I would love to um, take questions. Thank you. Does this help? Yes. All right. So in the scale that you used that led to flexibility in terms of the way the brain thinks, was the scale repeated in the same way every time, or was the scale itself flexible or varied? That's a really great question. Um, there were six different sequences, so they practiced six different ones, but they were fixed. They were not probabilistic or flexible in any way. Um, one person did six different little passages, yeah, but those passages were, were fixed. There, there was no, no change, so we're certainly not teaching improvisation. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could re review that the model that was the most connective, that you talked about a model that was uh, easier to, to understand either lecture or in a written form or whatever. It would be e more easily translatable. Could you repeat or kind of review that? Yeah, this, this modular structure that I show on the right-hand side. Um, so what we're finding is that we can develop a particular laboratory experiment where we show information that has that architecture. So it's a stream of information that's actually um, a walk on that graph. So if you imagine you're a person who can walk on pages, um, you would stand at one of those black nodes and, that, and then you would walk anywhere that there's a blue line, you would be allowed to walk, okay? But you couldn't walk in the white space. And so if you actually take a random walk through that graph, that provides you with a passage of 
this concept, then this concept, then this concept, then this concept, right? And so what we do is that we show humans that sequence of um, information that has that architecture behind it, and that's where we can tell, and then we have a little task for them to perform that tells us how well they learned it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, so the question is, um, is the preference for modular, a modular network for learning um, something that also holds for visual learning? Uh, because visual learning is not linear, was the statement. Um, so there's two important pieces of information to present about. One is that you can certainly see a sequence of images, and even though the images are two-dimensional, it's still a linear sequence. Um, and so you can still ask questions about what architecture those images should come in. And in that case, the modular structure is still quite good. Um, but it does raise the broader question of whether everything that we learn is mapped into the one dimension of time. It, you know, this is an example where I would say you have you know, one plus dimensions. So you had my voice, then you had some images in the back, right? And so this isn't perfectly um, boiled down to a single one-dimensional problem. But that is the first approximation, the first step, is the 1D mapping. Books are certainly one-dimensional unless you're reading a textbook that has figures in it. Danny, we have one over here. Yeah. Good question. Yes, uh, you, you showed a relationship between uh, the prevalence of short paths and IQ. Yeah. Is there a similar relationship when you look at creativity or you look at motor skill abilities or, or other, other endpoints? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, the, there, we have not seen any relationship with um, creativity. What we do see is that there is a pattern of connectivity between two particular parts of the brain that seem to be important for creativity. So that's between what's, what's called a default mode of the brain, which is the regions of your brain that are active when you're resting and very thinking internally, um, and separately a set of regions that are very active when you have to engage with the external world. And in fact, there's an interesting, the connectivity between those systems seems to be correlated with uh, creativity. That seems to be less affected, though, by the underlying stru shortest structural paths. So I think the story is a little bit more complicated there. Yeah. Thank you. Over here. Actually, my question is, uh, is two questions. Um, when you look at the reconfiguration of circuits associated with learning, uh, is that a, a random process in which uh, different synapses are, are tried and eventually one is decided to be optimal, and if that's the case, how does the brain decide what is the, the optimal configuration? What kind of information uses to decide that a configuration is better than the other one? Mm. So that's specifically related to the flexible connectivity that's correlated with learning, I think. Um, yeah, so I would definitely say that we cannot see synapses specifically at this scale, and so we can't say that these effects are related to synaptic plasticity um, because that happens at, a, at the micro scale. And we're up here at the macro scale using a magnetic resonance imaging where each of the pixels in our image is about one millimeter. So um, it's not... I, I don't think we can make any claims about specific synapses that are used or not used, but what we can say is that there's a change in where the information seems to be flowing in the brain as learning is occurring. And that could actually be because different cognitive processes are required early in learning versus late in learning. So there's actually some really beautiful historical work that suggests that um, once you learn 
let's, let's, let's think about this motor skill learning, for example. Motor skill learning is once you learn the, me the mechanics of, oh, I see this pseudo musical staff, and that means press this on the button box, there's a lot of very initial learning that's just about the structure of the experiment, right? And then after you've got that pretty nailed, then you go to making the actual movements much swifter. So there are often two stages of learning, and it's called early learning and late learning. Um, and they require different cognitive processes. So I actually think that some of this flexible reconfiguration that we observe is because what's required early in the learning of something can be quite different than what's required for the deeper or more automatic learning of something. Was there someone in the mezzanine who wanted to ask a question? Can you speak loudly? Mm. There's definitely some beautiful work in um, relating modularity to stroke, and specifically it relates modularity to um, the speed of recovery and the extent of recovery following stroke. So it does seem to be supportive of uh, the potential for recovery. I don't know about um, patients with MS who have had stem cell transplants, though. But certainly for stroke, the, the answer is yes, there is a correlation with uh, underlying modularity there. It's a great question. You talked about um, some comparisons of different species mm. and that our network structure is similar, um, but we've looked at learning in some of these other species. Do they learn in the same way that we do? Mm -hmm. Or because we learn language and writing, have we shaped how our networks want to be learned versus yeah. other species that are learning things? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so. Uh, the, sir, I actually have not studied learning in other species yet, so I don't know the answer to that question. Um, what we are hoping to do is to study um, younger children versus older children, not different species, um, but <laughs> they do process information very differently. Um, so at least we're going to be able to tackle that question, I think, relatively soon. But um, going to other species, we should certainly do, but we haven't done yet. Has there, has there been any study of these phenomena under altered states of consciousness? Hmm. Altered states of consciousness like s sleep? For example, by oh, <laughs> mind-altering drugs. Because yeah. we do have data about phenomena recently which has come out, for example, about how the mind changes under the influence of, say, LSD. Yeah. Microdosing of LSD, yeah. Um, there, are, there are definitely some studies that have been done to look at brain network architecture on and off LSD, um, but I don't, I'm not recalling immediately whether they specifically studied modularity, but they certainly studied changes in the brain network organization. I also don't think that they studied, I think it was um, an acute dose, and I don't think there was long-term follow-up afterwards. But uh, there is some literature out there, so I think you could probably search for it and, and find it. Um, yes? I was just curious, since you're using the example of musical notes and modeling how people learn and all of that, have you ever modeled somebody who's improvising in the different parts of the brain mm. because of you have muscle memory and then you have the creative aspect of creating something that hasn't been created before? Yeah, we have not studied people who improvise, but I would absolutely love to. What I have been thinking about, though, is that improvisation is basically, that is a walk through a relatively structured space, too. They know which passages naturally move into which other passages, and which um, chords would naturally move to which other chords, right? So they are walking through a somewhat structured space when they're improvising. Um, I've actually also been wondering to what degree that might relate to how we search for information. Is the process, process of improvisation actually a search, a search for a sound? And if so, does it actually have similar patterns to what we see in humans that are searching for new information? So we've been studying uh, people who are um, browsing Wikipedia. So these are volunteers in our study who uh, will browse Wikipedia and then allow us to see what they browsed. Um, for every day for 21 days, and they do it for 20 minutes a day. 
And so we can actually track how they're walking through the space of information. And we can ask questions about um, to what degree that relates to their personal um, sort of level of creativity that they um, propose, that, that they suggest that they have, and also other measures of their um, creative production. So I think that that's an interesting direction to go. We haven't included improv, improv people who do improv in that group of people, but I think that would be really interesting. Because I, I, I do think that the creative process is often very close to the search process. Okay, I think we have time for about two more questions. I have one over here. Hi, um, my father once shared with me the idea that when you're teaching, he gave me a suggestion, he said that people don't often remember everything that you said, but they will remember how you felt, how they felt when you said it. Hmm. And, and the notion was, you know, to engage with them emotionally and that they'll remember that much more powerfully. I'm wondering if you have explored the notion of how emotion, you know, is, is emotion like a learning accelerant, if people can connect, connect to something emotionally, yeah. Where that, what role that plays. I, the other thought I had is if this was a room and you were a stand-up comedian sharing an idea, mm. that idea could be transmitted really fast through the entire room mm. as, as, the, as the room is peeled with laughter. Or if you were a musician, they're connecting it emotionally, although the information is complex, it's kind of hitting them at a different level. I'm just wondering if you've done anything in that area. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. So certainly in a classroom situation, there's an emotional response or any performance there's an emotional response to the person who's presenting that information. I think it's even it's true for books as well. So my seven-year-old, the two days ago, was reading the dictionary as he does. Um, <laughs> we have we have a, a compact Oxford English dictionary, and I had initially thought a compact Oxford English dictionary that must mean it has fewer words than the whole thing, right? Um, but actually, it's just the whole thing, but with four pages per page. So it also comes with a magnifying glass, which is why the seven-year-old's really excited about it. Um, and every time, he, every time he pulls it out, it's quite old. He pulls it out and he says, I love that smell, that old book smell. Um, so even, I think, there's an emotional response to the book, um, even though, again, it's a linear passage of information, but you might remember it more because of the smell of the book. Um, so yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. We have not included that in our experiments yet, but I think it's, it's an important dimension to learning. It seems like the um, the network structure you're, you describe here is perhaps part of the basis of language, um, that we're receptive to certain ways of learning language. Have you studied how brains are different and how the networks work with different languages? Mm -hmm. People who speak uh, Chinese or Russian or English yeah. or multilingual people. Uh, that's a really great question. We haven't yet. Um, the, the individuals we're studying in this, the second language we're studying right now is mathematics. So we're trying to understand the architecture of mathematics and um, contrast that with the architecture of English and then understand the learnability of those two based on their architecture or whether you would present them in a different fashion. Um, so that's our, that's our initial effort, but, but I agree that going to, you know, the two, the more, the other kinds of languages wouldn't be a great idea as well. Okay, can we all give a round of applause to Danielle for her fantastic lecture? Thank you all for coming.